Welcome to Moments with Rose Art, the podcast where we highlight the importance of mental wellness and community connections through creative storytelling. In this episode, we're thrilled to have Dr. Brad Miller, the founder of Soccer Resilience and a clinical psychologist with over 22 years of experience. In this episode, Dr. Brad Miller will discuss with us how he started Soccer Resilience, a bit about what they do, how to support athletes' mental wellness, and he'll also touch a bit on his own journey as a former D1 college athlete. Tune in and enjoy the episode. Hello, Dr. Brad. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here for the interview for Rosart. Uh, we at Rosart are exceptionally impressed by the work that you and Soccer Resilience have been doing for folks in the community. And we are extremely grateful for you joining us here today. I'm really happy to be here and excited to have our conversation today. Thank you so much. Uh, so to get things started, Dr. Brad, can you share a little bit about soccer resiliency, uh, about soccer resilience for folks and listeners who might not be too familiar with it? Yeah, thanks again so much for having us on. Um, you know, soccer resilience is is a big passion of mine. Um, it was actually a dream of mine, um, you know, for, for many years, over about 10 years. Um, I... I I'm a clinical psychologist by background. Actually, on Tuesday, I'll be licensed 22 years. So I was thinking about that today. Um, and I have the honor of being with you today. So it's just really cool to keep meeting new people and trying to help, um, you know, one person every day. And so I, about 10 years ago, I had this idea. I'm like, oh, I'd love because I've been working with youth college and pro athletes for over uh, you know, 20 years and do that individually. Love that can get maybe more into about kind of where that came from. Um, but I started having that idea of like, if I could just do it and reach more people. And so I did it locally in San Diego for about uh, four years ago, did that for uh, two years and the pandemic came. I linked up with Wells Thompson, who's a nine-year pro um, with a, 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 as MLS Cup championship with Colorado Rapids. And he does a lot to get back to kids, work with kids. And we kind of had talked and said, now what if we combine powers? And we really try to make more of an impact. And so I can tell you more about that story. But so we started Soccer Resilience and Soccer Resilience really, you know, the four pillars of US soccer, right? There's technical, tactical, physical, and mental. And that fourth pillar has really been neglected. And most people aren't training it and they don't really know how to. So we are that club-wide solution, organization solution, team solution to train the fourth pillar. Um, and that's really what we do. And um, we have a very big focus on how. Yeah, everybody's like, let's be more confident, focused. Let's bounce back from mistakes, right? Let's be more fulfilled in what we do. But how do we do it? So we're very focused on the specific details of how. Uh, we have three main ways that we work with um uh, clubs and teams, individuals that we have uh, Zoom sessions or in-person sessions, depending on where you are in the United States. And we do those training sessions for teams. We do, we have an online academy, which is an awesome resource. We're so proud of it, where we have uh, our pro ambassadors, pros, current and retired pros from the NWSL, from MLS, uh, USL, uh, coaches, college coaches, pro coaches, and we have the online academy where it's really like uh, sessions and videos and online resources where you get to hear pros talk about their struggles, their challenges, and what tools and strategies they use. The online academy is a great, great resource for pros, college players, youth players. And we have information for coaches, players, and parents. So everybody's got something there so we can holistically serve you know, the whole soccer community. And our last one is we have one-on-one -on -one sessions that we provide where our pro ambassadors provide mental fitness coaching to players. And this has been enormously successful because you get to have a youth player, a college player who's going through struggles and kind of feels like they're alone. Something's wrong with me. I'm defective. And we have a pro go, hey, I have those struggles every week. Matter of fact, if you saw my game on TV last weekend, you would have seen when I made that poor pass and my hands went in my head, right? I feel that lack of confidence, but here's what I do to try to help me when I lose my confidence or I get disappointed in my performance. And so that really helps them relate to players and players go, wow, well, if you go through struggles like me and these things help you and you're a pro, gosh, maybe it can help me. And they get to build a relationship and all of our pro ambassadors, we purposely get to know them first. And they have two things that we need. One is they really need that special ability to connect and to care. And the second part is they really need to know a lot about mental fitness training. They need to live it, they need to use it so they can help instruct and teach them to do it. 
Um, so those are our three main main ways that we work. Uh, we're going to be developing some online courses this year, which are going to be great things for coaches, for players and parents that for one to just have sort of like a bite size, you know, sort of here's three or four things focused on specific areas. And we're also in the process of going to probably start writing a book this year. So a lot of things that uh, we have right now, but to add as well. Wow, that that's absolutely amazing. Um, and first of all, congratulations on completing your 22 years. And hey just just listening about like you know the work soccer resilience is doing it just it makes me so happy because uh myself i'm a clinical mental health therapist uh, i just recently graduated and i'm currently working towards my licensure and getting those hours done and majority of the stuff that i work with uh, involves working with kids and and improving their mental wellness and one of the resources that i utilize the most is soccer or sports itself um, because in my experience, as as a kid growing up, uh, personally, I'm a Manchester United fan for the last 21 years, and the most. See, I was just getting to like you, man. You're a Man United fan. I'm a Spurs <laughs> fan. Okay, that's okay. I'll, I'll look past that. I'll look past that. <laughs> well, well, I I feel like both of both of our teams are doing pretty well uh, that's true. this year. Um, yeah. We're in the Champions League spots, so I feel like that's so a good far. thing. <laughs> so far, yes. Uh, uh, but yeah, I when I speak to someone about my younger life or my uh, uh, my my journey growing up, majority of the things that I remember is soccer, is the connection that I had with Manchester United, or the connection or the happiness I found in like you know utilizing that as a tool. And when I work with kids, I I see it myself that a lot of kids are mostly focused on. Uh, the glamour aspect of the sports, uh, where uh, where they want to become the next Ronaldo, where they want to be called the next Messi. Uh, however, it's difficult for them to understand or comprehend the struggles that all those big athletes have gone or the sacrifices that they have made. So just hearing about like the stories of how your mentors work with uh, the upcoming athletes or folks in college and school, school athletes, it's it's wonderful. And it seems like a great uh, mentorship opportunity for uh, for them, for the professional individuals too. It really is. And it's really neat. I mean, they will say I get sometimes as much out of it as the people they work with, right? Because they you know, whenever you're sort of teaching someone and guiding them, right, you get that opportunity to reflect a little bit too and go, wow, I just spent in the last, you know, hour talking to, you know, my 17 year old that I'm coaching about confidence, huh, and now they're more aware of confidence too, and they're more aware of what they're doing. And sometimes just hearing that other, you know, other people, even the kids they work with, are going through struggles too, just reminds them, it's like, yeah, well, I've talked about my struggles, and it's like, yeah. And so it kind of creates more of that self awareness as well. And that's one of the nice parts of our mutual profession, right, of working mm -hmm. in the mental health field. It doesn't mean we're actually going to apply it, but we get a lot more opportunities to be aware, you know, and exactly. I think that's the neat thing the pros find too. And they just, they just love to get back because they were like, hey, I didn't have that. Like, you know, a a big part of soccer resilience too is, you know, for Wells and, I'm, I, I, and myself specifically, it's really turning our pain into purpose, the struggles we had and went through and saying, okay, we don't want these other athletes to have to suffer in silence. We don't want them to have to go through these things and have no tools and no ways to manage it or a, a place to go with that. And so when we can normalize those things and then give you those tools. And so a lot of the athletes too, they've had struggles on the mental side and want to get back and kind of wish someone would have come to them when they were younger. So they get that opportunity to do that now. Definitely. And I, I remember I was, uh, working with with one of my kiddo and we were talking about depression and I just pulled up an article from online where a specific uh, soccer player was talking about his depression and his struggles oh. when uh, he was not selected for the World Cup squad and just listening that that story for that individual for the kid I, I was working with it was very empowering that i'm not the only one who's going through it or i'm not the only one who's facing this there is someone that i look up to or someone that i follow or someone I, that i love ha is also go does also go through uh the same issues and all we have to do is like you know work together and find solutions for it absolutely yeah that's great i i i love that um before even soccer zanes came i would kind of like watch sometimes video clips on YouTube and be like, oh, I've got to do that. And I have a client would come in, you know, and I'd show them, even if it was a different sport, if I was a soccer player, I'm like, did you see, you know, what this NBA player said after a loss? You know what I mean? Because it is, it's just anything we can relate to, especially people we value and look up to and say, oh, they have struggles too. They have maybe some of the same struggles I do. 
it normalizes it, right, as you know, and then they go, and here's how they're trying to improve it, huh, maybe I can try to do that too, and I love that you do that, that's such a great thing. And how, how did your journey began as a, uh, as a counselor, and was this always the interest you had when you started uh, practicing, or did it slowly develop with uh, with time? So it's kind of an interesting place that uh, I, 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 so how I sort of came on my path as a psychologist, um, I uh, played soccer at Wake Forest, a Division One program, um, and it was a very competitive program. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about my performance anxiety piece in, in a second, but so just I was a business major going through interviews and kind of like, you know, you if you're a business major, you sometimes maybe go to like they have interviews at like banks and accounting firms and marketing agencies and things like that. And I just was like, it just doesn't fit for me. You know, it's great for other people, but it just didn't fit for me and I couldn't figure it out. And so we were, I was talking to one of my roommates um, and he's he played soccer with and he goes, Miller, he's like, his name's John Hackworth, who's actually now the uh, top assistant coach with the uh, MLS uh, team in St. Louis SC. Um, yeah, City SC. And so John goes, he, he's like, Hack goes, Miller, he's like, you're pretty much our team therapist anyway. We always talk to you on bus trips and plane trips. You might as well be a psychologist. And I was like, oh my gosh, I never, it sounds like I never thought about being a psychologist, had never taken a psych class, really hadn't read much books, never been to therapy, but it like something just clicked. I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, yeah, that sounds cool. And talking to my parents, like, that sounds cool. And so I was like, okay. And so that's where the journey started. So I had an extra year of eligibility because I had mono my junior year and got redshirted, couldn't play. And it turned out to be the best thing because I got to minor in psychology. I'd never taken a psych class. So I minored in psychology my last year. I got to play my last year of soccer and finally got some big starts. It took me five seasons to get starts at Wake Forest. I had to just grind, 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 work my way up. And it was super rewarding. Um, and that's kind of how the psychology journey started. And then um, when I graduates when I was in grad school and, and that I played college soccer and had a love for it always interested in kind of working with athletes um, in the internships I had didn't get as many opportunities but once I got licensed got kind of more but where sort of my passion for athletes comes from when I went to Wake Forest uh, I was a local kid got recruited to play you know Wake was a very strong program and I was really fortunate and they were like you know Brad you're you know, this 6'3", you know, really strong defender, you're athletic, you're fast, strong, you have those defensive skills, and you can step in and probably help, but your uh, technical uh, your technical skills are a liability. You're going to turn the ball over too much at this level. You don't play quick enough and fast enough, and we can't put you on the field. And if you want to work really hard, you can work your way up, and maybe you can contribute. And I was like, okay, perseverance was my greatest skill, just grind, grind. I was really good at it. So I was all ready for that, but I was totally unprepared prepared for performance anxiety, and it really hit me out of the blue. Um, all of a sudden, it was just, I think just, I wanted it so bad, and the stakes were so high, and I'd always started, played almost every game, that it was like, this was so difficult, and I just wanted so much that I overthought things. I would worry a lot about mistakes I might make. Like, every drill felt crucial. I had to be perfect in my passes, and my tackling, my one-on-ones, everything, in order for me just to try to get more playing time and maybe eventually get a start. And so I thought the stakes were so high all the time. I put all this pressure on me, always worrying about outcomes, how it was going to go, how it was going to go, how it was going to go. And I made things so much more difficult on myself. My soccer was my sanctuary where I went to get away from stress. But in college, it kind of was this love-hate relationship I had. And so, I mean, I love playing for Wake. I was so honored to have the opportunity, made some of my best friends for life to this day. But it was a back and forth. But I felt embarrassed and weak and soft. I didn't want anybody to know. So I just buried it. And it worked for a little bit, but it always came back and affected my confidence, joy, and performance. And many people I've talked to over the years I've played with, and I'll go, yeah, like, you know, I had performance anxiety, right? They're like, you did? I didn't notice it. And now my roommates would, because after every practice, this would be the conversation in our living room. Hey, Gilly, did you see me make that stop today? Did you see me win that tackle? He's like, I don't know, surprise. Did you see me win that header? Do you think coach saw it? Or then if I made a mistake, you don't think coach saw me make that pass, do you? You don't think he saw me lose that battle, do you? Right. And that's how my mind would go. So I didn't really have any tools or strategies. So when I became a psychologist, I was like, okay, I want to help athletes be able to have tools and strategies. So they don't have to suffer like I did, because the truth is there's so many simple strategies that can really help us manage our stress or worry on the field, off the field, help us be have more joy in what we do, enhance our performance, all those things. It just takes consistency. So that's my passion. It's really taken my pain to purpose. So for many years, I'd be like, gosh, bad, why couldn't you pull it together? I knew 
how how much I could have played and what I could have been at Wake, and I was my biggest obstacle. And I used to regret that and be hard on myself. But really, the last couple of years of soccer is in. So it's really helped me really get a, a, a firm believing that that is the best thing that happened to me because that's why I'm so passionate. So I, I did a um, session with a, just a touch and go academy uh, in Orange County, California um, on last Friday. And the afterwards, some of the girls talking about like what they got out of it. This one girl goes, well, I realized I'm not alone. Other people go through this too. And, you know, there's ways to help. And I was like, yes that's where my passion comes from, right? It's like just watching those kids be like, there's ways to help myself through things. Um, and so certainly in my clinical practice, but also soccer resilience. Um, so that's kind of how soccer resilience came to be. And that's where the passion kind of came from. And Wells has the same story. Uh, he had a very uh, you know successful career um, as an MLS player for many years. Um, and he showed with depression and anxiety I um, mean, had an eating disorder because he just was looking for any edge he could get. And he would double down on fitness. He said something really powerful that for the athletes listening, he goes, you know, he's like, when I would get really stressed and things were difficult, I would double down on fitness. He goes, I came into camp, the most fit player. He won the beat test. He's like, but Brad, just mentally, I was not in a good place, you know? And I think so many athletes do this. Like, I don't know what to do, but I'm just going to work hard. I'm just going to be more fit and more fit. So now we're just very, very fit. But our struggles, and I relate to that at Wake too. It's like I was fit and everything else, but mentally I was not in a good place, right? And so that's where I really love talking to athletes about just physical fitness is wonderful and clearly essential to do well and great for your health. But we need strategies beyond just you know running harder to get our mental fitness where we need it to be. I mean, as a Manchester United fan, I'll completely, completely agree with you because I feel like that was a big, big, big concern that my team was having for the last two seasons. Um, and that's something that this manager is currently working on, changing that. And you can clearly see the difference that, that they're yeah. having, the difference that more team celebrations, more team energy is bringing up. They're lifting one another up by, like, you know, probably sharing on their own stories in, in the dressing room about mm -hmm. how they overcame came up results. Because I remember, like, last year, two years ago, if we were losing a game at 70th, 80th minute, I would 10% of nine times of, out of 10, I would not be hopeful for a comeback. But yeah. now I, I do know that there is always a chance because of the mentality that this manager is building up and the mentality that's being um, blossomed up in, in, into the team itself. And I feel like a, another great example of this seen through Rashford because uh, yeah. he looked like a completely shell of a player last season because of how low his confidence was. And uh, I'm extremely grateful that he himself has come out and spoken about it, that he was not exactly mentally there where he was supposed to be, which is why things were just not happening. He was trying his level best. And as a United fan, as someone I, who I, I love him, probably he's one of my favorite players, I could actually see it in his body language last season that he's giving his best, but it's it's just not working. It's yeah. like, it's just not working. He's running. He's trying to, like, you know, do the most for his, for the team. But probably something's just lacking up mentally and it's just not clicking. Yeah, yeah. You know, actually, I mean, and as a Spurs fan, it's hard to say, but I love Marcus Rashford. I really do. You know, and him being vocal about his struggles with depression and his story um, is it, just such an inspiration to see. Um, and And so many athletes have been so brave and courageous, you know, to come out um and share their story and ironically that's how i really met wells he put up a post on linkedin and just said you know that after you know uh retirement that it that he shows anxiety and depression sometimes because it's hard to transition and i just was like man thanks so much for sharing that i'm gonna you know tell athletes i work with you share your story it's great that's how we actually linked up um so yeah it, it, it it's been in the, the pandemic as you know has had a lot of tremendous difficulties but one of the really good things to come from it is more and more athletes across sports um genders everything has been coming out and talking more openly about hey yeah i've had some mental health struggles or i currently still have these and this is what i do mm -hmm. And in, in your experience uh, and working with soccer resilience and working with different clubs and organizations, uh, where do you feel like uh, there is the most need uh, of mental wellness awareness? Is it, is it in the youth departments? Is it uh, in the college schools? Or is it more in the first team and uh, those departments? Yeah, boy, it's a great question. Um, and I think it's everywhere. 
you know, still, I mean, there are um, lots of teams in the MLS who sometimes they'll have a person you can schedule an appointment with, but that person isn't sort of as accessible, you know, um, WSL, I think has made it, if I'm correct, has made it like a mandatory requirement that every team's got a, a clinical psychologist or a therapist you can connect to, but some of them, again, they're offsite um, and they're fuller. It's hard to get appointments with and things. So there's absolutely the pro I, I, in these last couple of years working more and more pros. I've been shocked at how little pros are provided for. Um, it's getting better, but it's, it's just shocked me. So I think the pros absolutely need it because of the enormous pressure and intensity in their life their economic life, you know, is on the line. Um, so they certainly need it that, you know, what what really our sort of main heart is working with youth clubs. Uh, we work with lots of colleges, which we love too. Every different group, pros, college and youth clubs have a different way you can connect them and what they do. But our heart is really youth clubs. That's really where we want to make the most impact because we can reach them earlier. You know, we love working with colleges and some of them may or may not go on to be pro, but what if we get those people even earlier, right? And so we get the players younger, and I think that's so crucial. And, you know, we know that, um, you know, in 2021, the Surgeon General came out and said that we are in a mental health crisis for children and adolescents. And many kids are dropping out of sport. Um, they're having more struggles. I mean, we, we work with so many different clubs throughout the United States, and we have many, many times where coaches and directors are like, hey, we've got kids who are like throwing up in trash cans before games. We've got kids who aren't getting out of the car in the parking lot before games. We've got kids who just because of some struggles with anxiety and depression are no longer playing the sport. Um, and so, you know, that they really need some tools to help them with their mental health, but sort of, you know, their, their mental fitness. And what we do, which I think is so special, is that we really help take some of that stigma away because we have pros come on and talk about, hey, you know, when I was your age, I show with anxiety or depression, this was difficult for me. And maybe some of you are going through that now, you know what I mean? And so it makes it like a conversation about these things where it opens the door for people to say, okay, people I look up to, as we talked about, like they're doing that. And then we also, storytelling is the way that you really, to me, it's like, that's what we walk away with, right? For, you know, when I listen to a podcast, I'll hear lots of great information, but there's usually a story that stays with me, Right. And so we realized that with soccer resilience. And so, you know, as a clinical psychologist, I can go and have a conversation and share stories and do things. And hopefully it's helpful. But when a pro does it and they share a story, right, it just has more staying power. And that's become our sweet spot. And no one else is doing it in the way that we are. And I'm just so proud of the pros that we work with and, and, and part of our team and our family. Um, but they really make that impact with the youth players in such a special way. Um, and so to me, I think youth is the greatest place we can go because, you know, there are going through so many unique things. Like I never went through school with a pandemic before and all the different challenges they're going through and their rates of rank, anxiety and depression. And so the beautiful part is that we help kids with their mental health, their fitness, and we help them with performance, you know, but we can work on all things. And we know that when our head's right, our body's right, and we're going to play better, right? So we can help players and teams win more and, and and reach the success they want to while also being more mentally well along the way. I also feel like for even those individuals who are in those youth academies who probably are unable to make the first team, it's really important for them to receive services and like, you know, guidance and uh, hear stories uh, such as these because just just reading about like, you know, the rejection stories that folks go through when all from the child from a very young age till an 18 or a 17, 16, when their whole goal or their whole mission is to play for that one specific club, but that when that call doesn't come up, they a lot of them I have read that uh, go through Im immense emotional trauma and like ha I have uh, taken part in self harm, su 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 suicides, wow. and it's it's it it just hurts me a lot uh, in ways because like you know just just because they feel like there is no other door left for them to yeah. knock on or there is no other option for them to like you know. Yeah, and, and I know that those stories are, are, are very, very sad to hear. And, you know, we, one of our uh, core values, our first core value at Soccer Resilience is more than an athlete. 
and we actually did a presentation with the uh, Charlotte Independence uh, Middle School and High School girls. And one of our ambassadors, Kylie Kurtz, North Carolina Courage, it was awesome. So we go through about our purpose and we talk about the difference between a performance identity and a purpose-driven identity, right? That performance identity where my value, my self-worth comes from how I perform, whether that's in the classroom, when I play music, when I you know, dance and I go play soccer, whatever it is. And so many athletes who are do exceptionally well, right, are more vulnerable to have that because they are achieving things who are giving that feedback. And, you know, that perfectionist is often much more present in elite athletes. And so that can kind of become a really dangerous kind of pairing, right? My performance is all my days about my performance. I'm perfectionistic. So I'm incredibly self-critical and negative and harsh when I don't perform well. And so we would talk to them about how you can have a purpose-driven identity, how you can have an identity that's not based solely on how you perform, right? That I'm a friend. What am I like as a friend? What am I like as somebody has a different hobby and interest? And so we had Kylie Kurtz come on and, you know, she was like an All-American in South Carolina and she's a six-year pro in Novacell, went to Novacell championships. And she has pictures of her with her boyfriend and with her family and with her dog. And here she is skiing and here she is you know, going out and snorkeling, right? It's like you see her things. And so I, and I go, Kylie, tell me this. So most people think if you want to become an elite athlete and a, or be a college pro athlete, you have to make everything live, breathe, and eat soccer. And she laughs and goes, no, that is not true. That's actually going to be detrimental. You have to have a balance, right? We need a balance. And so that's what I think is so important when we talk to these youth players, too, is about what are you doing outside of soccer to give you enjoyment, mental recovery. We all talk about physical recovery, and clubs have gotten so much better we know how to recover, but we don't talk about mental recovery. And if we don't have mental recovery, that is the key to resilience, right? That's We're not going to be mentally sharp and focused the next day. So many times, I think, with sports and just in life, people just expect our mind to be on. Like you are on a podcast today. We just expect our mind to be alert, focused, and here we go. Well, if we don't get a decent night's sleep, we don't hydrate, eat well, have some good exercise, do maybe some breathing meditation, something, our mind isn't just going to show up and be ready. And physically, as athletes, they would never do that. Athletes would never just like, well, I got a game on Saturday at three o'clock. I'm just going to stay up till five. I'm going to eat like, you know, pound a two liter Pepsi and drink, a, have a bunch of fries and burgers and eat donuts in the morning and, you know, show up and I'll just like walk around the field for two minutes. Now I'm going to play a full 90 game. They would never do that. But mentally, that's what a lot of players almost do. They just show up and go, I understand. Why wasn't I in the game? Well, what did you do to help your mind get into the game? And most people don't have an answer. And that's, again, a big part of what we do is we break those things down and say, this is how you can prepare your mind mentally the days leading up to the game, the night before, the morning of, the couple hours before, while you're warming up, you have a physical warm up. What's your mental warm up? How do you mentally get engaged? How do you mentally get, stay engaged when you're getting distracted, lose focus in the middle of games? And after a game, how do you mentally recover from a training or practice? So your mind is ready to go the next time and wants to go back. Um, so those are just, you know, uh, and this kind of went off a little bit on a tangent from your question about who, who gets it. But, um, but, but those types of things, helping players understand that we need balance. I, I wanted to ask you how challenging has it been uh, to implement a, uh, to implement a sports or something that's so physical through uh, Zoom sessions uh, because of the challenges we currently face? It's a great question. Um, and, and, and it's kind of interesting. So I did, um, since Soccer Resilience started with, 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 with Wells, we were together for the last three years, be three years in July. Um, we've now started to do some more in-person sessions. So San Diego State Men's uh, Soccer Program, um, their D1 program, so I've been able to present to them. And then uh, last Friday with the uh, Touch and Go Academy in Tustin, California, those are the two times I've done it since the pandemic. Um, so we have just people different geographically. Uh, Wells is in North Carolina, Raleigh. So he's been able to, we've had some of our pro ambassadors um, with Charlotte FC and SoCo Club in Virginia be able to do some of those presentations with the high schools too. So. You know, what's interesting is that um, there's pros and cons to both. You know, one of my favorite things is when people say, well, like, is something good or bad, right or wrong, or should I do this or not? And I always say, well, the answer depends. I think that's the answer to every question. It depends. And so is Zoom helpful, unhelpful? The answer to me is it depends. We found that some clubs who actually can have people go in person like the Zoom because they're busy. So you got youth players, right? Especially like middle school and then high school. You're busy with school and the demands that they're like, I would have to drive sometimes 20, 30 minutes to go to 
a clubhouse or to the field to do that maybe on a different day and then drive back and a zoom makes it simple because I can just do it right there. You know, mm -hmm. so that has been something that people like um, we record all of our sessions. So if someone's not able to get on a parent, a coach or a player, they can go back and watch the recordings. That gives that flexibility. Um, there's a ton of value in person and we love being in person. And I think that is the ideal uh, geographically. We just have people located in different spots where it just wouldn't really be um, an option or it's a very difficult option. Or we maybe do it once you know, or kind of twice. But I think the thing with Zoom, uh, when it started, Wells and I were doing them ourselves and we would just, we, you know, I mean, Wells and I both like to be goofy and silly. And so, you know, working as a psychologist with, you know, you, you know, players for a long time, college players, you just kind of try to be energized. Like, how can we do that? Right. And so Wells and I would kind of like pump each other up. And so we'd be like, okay, let's go, let's do this. And we'd kind of be funny and goofy and we'd get a crack of smile here and there. And we got more engagement. So we found some ways to really be engaging and then having pros talk is a very powerful way even when it's on zoom people want to show up and hear a pro they want to hear the pro talk right and then what's so much fun into those questions are of a session sometimes they'll ask questions during but it's like well hey we've got some time you want to ask the pros any questions and people are like oh yeah who's your favorite team what's your favorite soccer drill uh what was your hardest you know game you had as a youth player you know what i mean what's the position you hate to play you know what do you like to eat for dessert? And so they just like love under getting to know them and connecting. So it's such a big part. So in Zooms, we really do such a good job of connecting and relating, right? And that vulnerability and showing those challenges and then how to do that. So Zoom, we found a way to really make that a lot more engaging. Um, so that's been really, really good. And again, sometimes some people just prefer that for the simplicity of it. Um, it's sort of like doing a therapy, teletherapy. I have some people who go, is it okay if we just keep doing this? I know you're back in your office, but I just like doing this. It's easy. It's quick. I'm doing traffic and things. So it kind of depends logistically. Um, so those have been some of the challenges, but we found ways to be creative and more and having the pros on there really helps that a lot, you know, because people are like, heck yeah, like I'm a, you know, a little zoomed out, but I will go listen to this pro and I get to ask them questions and it's live. It's not just a recording, but it's live. I get to kind of see them and do that. They're like, yeah, so that's been really cool. Um, and then in person, it's just a different element, you know, when you're in person, you can just, you know, more of that kind of energy and those types of things kind of feeds off of you. Um, but we've been doing the zoom for, for such a while that, uh, still can, can have a lot of fun and bring a lot of energy to get people engaged. Well, yeah. I, I feel like one thing this pandemic has really brought us, uh, and helped us in a way is in terms of accessibility, um, uh, it has really, really, really helped us grow in terms of accessibility. Um, as a counselor and and, and as a uh, psychologist, how would you um, how would you encourage other counselors or younger psychologists to utilize sports in their practice with their clients? Because in in my practice, I usually see uh, them having a completely uh, different body language and a different session as when they are indoors with me in my office as compared to when I take them outdoors just for a walk or to play them uh, to play soccer with them and to like you know utilize th that in their treatment how important do you think that that could be for uh, counselors yeah it's, uh, 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 do you work in a school setting mm -hmm. yeah um, I worked in school settings too and, and one of the things I love about a school setting is you get to do that Yes. Right. You can kind of go for a walk. You can kind of go and shoot baskets. You can kick a ball around. You can do things. And when you're kind of doing that activity, right, like a, it, then you just get more comfortable. Right. Just like you and I, if we were just sitting in two chairs across from each other. But if we're doing an activity together, knocking a ball around and just talking while we do it. Right. It just kind of feels more. comfortable. So I love that option that you have. That's fantastic. I think that's such a great way to connect. Um, I think kids in motion, kids just like to be in motion. Right. The movement, I think, is really good. And so it just helps them you know, be more comfortable. And when they're those, you know, sometimes younger kids get uncomfortable in silence or transitions. And if you're doing some activity, you just have it built in, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So I really mm -hmm. like that. Um, you know, and, and, and I think that that activity part is great. You know, it kind of feels to some kids more like a mentor than a counselor, even though you're delivering counseling, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's, it kind of feels like a, you know, like a mentor in that way. Um, and I also feel like they also get relaxed. Their body language becomes relaxed. They're not as stern. It does not look like, you know, it's a, uh, because I've worked with elementary kids. It could be different with every age grab, uh -huh. but with elementary kids, when they come up in, in my sessions, they usually prefer those kinds of sessions that are less structured because they are already going through so much of structure throughout their day. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, and I think just finding that activity that they're engaged in. So some kids, maybe sports, not their thing, but they like to walk or maybe mm-hmm. they like chess. Say, so let's play chess and talk. And so I think that that's a great thing. And so, you know, uh, in your question about using sport, I think um, whatever somebody's interested in, if you can speak their language in any way, you know, so if and, and, I, and what I find, too, is that a lot of kids love to teach. So I remember that when I first was working with teenagers and I was like, okay, I got to know everything. I got to know every band, everything that's cool. I got to be up on out slang, everything, you know? And I remember that sometimes I would be trying too hard and they could see it, right? And it didn't work. It was awkward. I'm like, okay, that's not going to work. And I go, you know, why not just be honest? And so they're like, hey, do you know what this is? I have no idea. I, I like, but I'd love you to show me. Oh, cool. And I found that once I started doing that, even now, I'm 52 even now and work with teens and stuff, they're like, you have no idea what this is, right? I'm like, no, I have no idea. They go, and I'm, I'm like, but I'd love to learn. They go, okay, cool. And they love to show you stuff, right? So, hey, check out this app, watch this band, listen to this song. You know, let me show you this move, whatever it is, right? And so I think that's a really cool way to engage. So just for the people, like you said, who are maybe like, you know, working with youth and maybe if they're newer in that part of their career is you don't have to have all the answers, you know what I mean? But just be genuine connect and then give them opportunities to teach you what their world is. And that's a really cool way to open up and that gets them comfortable. And then once you know that thing, if it's, you know, BMX, if it's like skateboarding, if it's soccer, if it's basketball, if it's chess, whatever it is, or violin, whatever music, and then you can then relate that in. That's such a great way to weave that in. And I think like for soccer resilience, it makes it easy because we all played soccer. The people we're talking to play soccer, right? So it just streamlines and really nice. And there's such a cool thing when you can just speak those nuances, right? You know, as you're talking to a kid and you're in a position, you're playing like, oh, so what's it like in this and this and this type moment? And they're like, looking at you like, you actually know that? And it makes them comfortable, right? And so, you know, and if they don't play soccer and you're working with you kids, then what that thing is for them, you know? Um, and so, yeah, so, so any way that we can get that relatability and they feel like that we value them, you know, and asking questions is such a cool way for people to feel like we care, you know, and we can learn more. And so you have a really cool opportunity for those people who maybe don't have that opportunity. Sometimes you can get a little creative. Sometimes like the older kids don't want to walk around and be seen because they feel embarrassed or, you know, and sometimes mm-hmm. little kids are like, I don't care, let's go for a walk. Um, but that's great. You have that opportunity. Thank you. Uh, so, so just to wrap the things a little bit up, how would you, what would you call to be some upcoming goals that uh, you and your team have set up for soccer resilience? I know World Cup is coming up and Club World Cup is coming up. Are you folks thinking of getting involved during that time with uh, activities that might be happening in the country? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, so we definitely are aware that, you know, the Women's World Cup is coming up, you know, uh, soon this summer and, that's going to be really exciting. And then the doors that get opened by the World Cup being in, you know, United States, Mexico and Canada here. Um, so that is definitely something that we want to do. Our, our hope... And I think the Club World Cup is also coming up in 2025, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, do you know where that's going to be? It's going to be somewhere in the U.S., but I don't know what, oh. what cities they have decided yet. Oh, okay. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah. You know, and but so, I was reading that they're planning 2025 to take place in the U.S., but I, I don't yeah. know how, how much of it is confirmed or official yet. Yeah, why well, kind of laugh? So I'm 52, so I say that when I'm 75 years old, I'm gonna hang it up for good. So I go, I have 23 <laughs> years left to keep going. And what I want to do, what soccer resilience is like, we just want to make that these services, working on train the fourth pillar, on the mental fitness and youth sports, not just soccer, but in youth sports, is becomes the norm, right? That becomes almost an expectation when a parent says, I want to, you know, have my son or daughter play basketball or whatever it's gonna be soccer. That they're like, well, what do you guys do on the mental training side, the mental fitness side, you know, and if we can make that become more the norm, that would be fantastic. And so we think about 2026, right? What are ways to help, you know, um, one of our uh, ambassadors, Walker Zimmerman plays for the U.S. men's national team, um, you know, and so he's our first ambassador, actually, who kind of just joined us, which is super cool. Um, You know, so just sort of how do we help spread the message about, you you know, resilience and and mental fitness and how crucial that is, you know, as playing. So our hope is that, you know, just as more and more interest keeps getting generated in the the United States around soccer, that we're looking at the mental fitness aspect as well. I think that coupled with the mental health crisis that we're in, we put those two together and go, it's a win-win. You want to perform better and win more and feel be better mentally in the process and help you mentally for what comes next and all the ups and downs. 
Um, so I think the World Cup will create some great opportunities for us that we're, you know, trying to kind of take it one kind of piece at a time. You know what I mean to kind of do that, but mm -hmm. we've been thinking mm -hmm. about it. exactly how that's going to look, but really want to help make that mental fitness part of the World Cup uh, something that's much more in the conversation. We're hoping we, we can be a big part of that process to make that happen. Um, uh, I also had one little question before we go off. Sure. Uh, how has Tottenham Hotspurs helped you in your mental wellness journey as a uh, as from a very young age? And how did that play uh, a big role in what you are like, you know, today? So, you know, sports for me was, um, it was just kind of like my sanctuary just to get away from stress. I love to just compete. I really, really did. Um, I just love the physicality of it. I've always been kind of like a defender. And so I just love to, you know, when I play pickup and kids, I love being like, okay, I'll take the two players who maybe we think aren't as strong against you guys. And I'm just going to freaking try to lock it down so you can't score. I, I just love to compete and do that. And it was just fun for me. I was really fortunate as a kid. My my first club team, um, which is now North Carolina Fusion, but was Winston-Salem Twins. Ironically, Wells and I grew up in the same city, went to the same uh, a wake forest but we he, he's a little bit younger but so we didn't really know we lived three miles apart but so we both played for twin city and so it was like a soccer family it's the same group of people throughout my entire youth career now that's not quite as common but then it was great um and so it, it just gave me that place to go away from stress you know what I mean when I went to soccer practice I just felt really happy um you know and, and got to compete and so it's a huge part of me having resilience and helping me bounce back from just, you know, challenges and struggles that I would go through. That was kind of my place. Um, and then with, you know, college, it kind of flipped upside down. Now it was like, boy, this is like a giant source of my stress, right, where I'm constantly worried and things. Um, but but my love for soccer helped me through even with that kind of stress. And so soccer has just and, and now with soccer, it's just a way to stay connected to the game. Working with athletes over all these years is a way to stay connected and just watching, um, you know, the, the pro ambassadors we have and like, you know, them on their mental fitness journey. You know what I mean? And some of them have said, like, I didn't really use much this before I started working with you guys. And now boy, I'm a big believer and they become some of our best advocates because they're like, here's my pro game before and kind of now, uh, but, but sports has always been kind of that, that therapy for me as a youth, uh, which I'm super grateful for. How can people connect with Soccer Resilience or how can they visit your website? Uh, what, what could be some of the options that uh, they could utilize? Um, you know, they can find us at soccerresilience.com you know, is a good kind of landing page. Um, we have our online academy. We really priced it low to help people. So it's $10 a month or it's $100 for a family for an entire year. So just, you know, don't go and get a Starbucks coffee or something and a bagel and you're covered. And I um, mean, if a team wants to come along, it's $300 for a whole team for a whole year. It's like $10 a person. Um, and we, the, 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 the information in there is not only going to help with your mental fitness and performance, but just helps you with your resilience to manage the stressors of life. Um, so anybody who's kind of like, huh, and for you too, you want to go check it out and go, oh, there's some resources. You can buy a monthly subscription and check it out and go, huh. Okay, you know, yeah, I can use this, 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 and this, right? It's just a neat resource to have. There's so many videos of pros talking things. So you can just show people and go, hey, struggle with confidence? Check this out. You know, you're going through a difficult time. Well, look at what Brianna Pinto did when she was with the U17 national team. So you just get to see those pros saying things. It can be a really cool way. So it's a great library of information, too, if anybody is interested. They can uh, they can also email me at a Dr. Brad Miller at soccerresilience.com. No, thank you so much. Thank you so much for all the work that you are doing with Soccer Resilience and the awareness that you and the and your company is is raising around uh, not just soccer but sports in general. I feel like it's incredible and uh, it just empowers more people to come out and share their stories, tell their stories, and while empowering individuals who might actually be in need. You're welcome, and and I just want to say I think it's wonderful what you you and your partners are starting your business right, what you guys are launching and doing. I'm super excited to check out your digital magazine. That's going to be really cool. Um, and you have it in different languages, which I love. Let's serve as many people as we can. Um, so just keep with it, you know, that, that it makes an impact and a difference. And the thing I always tell myself is like, just help one person today. Like before I get in this podcast, I always get nervous. And I was going to help one person today. If I can help one person, okay. And then it feels like, okay, that's kind of doable. So it gets kind of overwhelming at times, like trying to, how are we going to do it? But but I love what you're doing. Um, you can just hear your care for those people you work with. So all those kids you get to 
see they're really fortunate to work with you. And just thanks again for giving me this opportunity to meet you today. This might become a bit philosophical, but I feel like we have been sent in this world to improve and make changes for the tomorrow. And uh, I completely agree and resonate with how you how you are how you feel about if we have been through something, we don't want that someone else going through that same struggle or same uh, journey. And which is why I feel like the work that you are doing with soccer resilience is highly highly inspirational. And thank you so much for coming here today and agreeing to do this interview. Thanks again, Z. Appreciate your time today.